Good afternoon and welcome back to Never Is Now, ADL's signature summit on anti-Semitism and hate. My name is Adam Lehman. I am truly privileged to be able to serve as president and CEO of Hill International. And I'm honored to moderate this next panel on confronting anti-Semitism on campus, a how-to guide. As you may know, Hillel and ADL have been collaborating extensively in recent months to address the truly disturbing rise of anti-Semitic activity on campus. Together, we've developed a curriculum to train students and all Hillel professionals about how anti-Semitism manifests on college campuses today. And we launched reportcampushate.org together with the Secure Communities Network. That is a website a centralized website where students can report anti-Semitic activity and receive immediate support. We also have worked on a, camp, a comprehensive survey about anti-Semitism on campus. We just released the results of that survey a few weeks ago. And uh, sadly, but in very real terms, it validated the very significant uh, presence of anti-Semitic activity on campus, a full uh, one third of the students who responded and participated uh, indicated that they had personally experienced anti-Semitism on campus during the past school year. So we're going to dig deeper and discuss not only what these issues represent, but uh, the steps we are all taking to respond to them. And I want to welcome in right now a terrific group of panelists who are going to be joining me for today's panel. Uh, we have Jasmine Bruchim, a junior at UCLA and a member of the executive team of Bruins for Israel. Jordan Robinson. Jordan is a senior Sparty at Michigan State University and a member of Hill International's student cabinet. Barun Sony, Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at the University of Southern California. Thank you, Barun. And Debbie Unker Kale, Hillel's Executive Director at Arizona State University. So, welcome to all of you today. Uh, you can learn more about each of the panelists in this program by going to the speakers page on the Never Is Now website. For the program itself, I'm going to kick it off by sharing a series of questions with our terrific group of panelists, but we're also interested in hearing your questions for those of you tuned in right now. There's a Q&A button to the right uh, of the video that will be uh, there throughout the panel. So please go ahead and submit your questions through that Q&A button. And during the second part of the program, we'll get to as many of those uh, audience questions as we can. But to kick things off, I'm going to go to Jazzy uh, at uh, UCLA. We really all are here to understand the student experience on campus, understand the role that anti-Semitism is unfortunately playing within that. What is your sense of the current experience for Jewish students on campus? And what role, if any, is anti-Semitism now playing in, in campus climate? Sure. Um, I am super excited to be on this panel to begin. UCLA has presented itself to be an amazing school, but unfortunately, as students and Jewish students on campus, we are taking hits after hits of anti-Semitism coming after in May. We, I think there was a sense of frightenment coming back to school, but what happened was we came here scared, but came here also prepared for the reality that we were going to face. Um, my Israel class right next door, it was vandalized with the statements free Palestine from river to the sea. We've seen a lot of flyers with anti-Semitism rhetoric. Um, I think being a student, a Jewish student on campus, it's a difficult time. I think that we are grappling with how to stand up as proud Jews, but also keep in mind of our safety. And we've been reckoning with that in a lot of spaces here at UCLA, whether that's engaging with our chancellor, engaging with Hillel professionals, 
But again, as I mentioned, as it's a difficult time, it's also a time for us to unite and come together um, and hopefully seeking a better community for us all. Wonderful. Thank you, Chazzy, for starting us off and uh, just sharing the reality of uh, what the experience is like for students. I'm going to shift uh, to Debbie for the, the Hillel and uh, Jewish community professional perspective. You unfortunately have had to deal with a really significant situation just last week with truly appalling anti-Semitic flyers that were posted on campus at ASU. Can you walk us through how Hillel's respond when these kinds of uh, events take place? And just more broadly, what is the role of Hillel when it comes to uh, addressing these situations for students uh, and for the broader campus community? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Adam. Um, you know, I like to say that no campus is immune. Um, and so, you know, every so often some things come up at ASU that we're dealing with as well. And I certainly see my colleagues dealing with their fair share of anti-Semitic challenges throughout the country. Um, at any anti-Semitic incident, we do have a multi-pronged response um, that helps us connect with students, administrators, and our local community um, in a place like Arizona State, um, the broader, you know, Phoenix Jewish community also takes a, a pretty significant interest in campus life. And so you know, we certainly consider them a stakeholder as well. And our goal is always to communicate, convene and collaborate um, and of course to support. So with students, we tend to gauge sentiment first. How are they feeling? What have they seen? Um, we certainly want to gather as many facts as we can about the situation. How many flyers, where, who saw them, when, all those details. Um, and for students, we often provide a place to gather. Um, and we also help them understand what reporting options they have. I'll say, you know, just as general community education, we try to make sure students know how to report all bias incidents. For us, that means having links on our link tree on Instagram. You know, every community kind of does what works for them. Um, and we were um, recently posted the uh, report campus hate one as well. So students have a lot of reporting channels. With administrators, we're always immediately in touch, often with Dean of Students and po Campus Police um, and others. We try to understand how they're proceeding, how Hillel can support them, um, what meetings we can support between students and administrators. And for our community, you know, I'll send regular updates to stakeholders. And depending on the situation, we may find ourselves more or less engaged with other local or national support systems. And um, we often receive quite a bit of support from Hello International during these challenges and just try to support each other through them. But um, often it's just, you know, it's a multifaceted approach because Hello is a unique place with our campus relationships as well as, um, of course, you know, our first mission of supporting students. students. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we are, as I said at the beginning, I feel privileged. I think we are privileged to be able to play the role we play on campus, you know, being there literally 365 days of year. Um, but that comes with a lot of responsibility, including what you just outlined. Just as a quick follow up, um, can you unpack a little bit more uh, since we are talking about uh, the how to guide piece of addressing these issues? What does it take to work with uh, administrators from the Hill professional perspective to try to achieve a, you know, achieve progress and really take these issues on? Uh, the most important thing is not different than how we work with students, it's relationships and relationships are not formed during moments of challenge or crisis. Uh, we certainly, you know, maybe talk more often with some of our campus colleagues when we're having a challenge. But I'd say the most important thing is to have longstanding relationships that work um, on a variety of levels and issues. And that's something that in you know my almost nine years here, I've worked very hard to do. Um, it's right in the beginning of the playbook for all new directors. Um, and you know to, to have regular meetings with our administrators just to check the pulse on campus climate overall is really important. Um, you know, and there's a lot of different supports in place to help more broadly educate the campus around um, campus climate or Jewish experience, particularly the campus climate initiative that um, that Hillel International has launched a partnership between university administrators and local Hillels to do just that, explore how Jewish students are being impacted by hate and taking real steps to improve the campus climate. And again, those things happen, you know, over time um, in steps that work for those individual um, individual settings. 
Yeah, and I really appreciate your point around uh, the the benefit and need to actually be building relationships throughout the year and throughout the course of, of the careers of the people involved. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, when organizations you know parachute in to try to try to deal with an issue on campus, it can literally even backfire if those relationships are not there uh, and aren't uh, in a the relationships aren't in a place to actually um, advance the ball. So thanks for, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move on to Jordan. Um, Jordan, after uh, unfortunate anti-Semitic activity at Michigan State, you showed real leadership to try to work uh, at the student government level to get a definition of anti-Semitism adopted. Tell us about why you viewed that as an important step, uh, the opposition you faced, what actually happened in terms of uh, the process and what you learned from the experience? Yeah, uh, thanks, Adam. So here at Michigan State, um, starting the spring semester of 2021, um, I would say around February is when <clears throat> myself, um, some of the student interns, as well as our Hillel staff, started hearing rumors that a BDS resolution was going to be proposed. Um, we didn't know when this was going to happen. It could have happened the next day, a month, three months from then. Um, but regardless, we still heard this rumor. Multiple people in student government heard it as well. And so um, we decided to take a proactive approach um, and propose the IHRA or IRA definition of anti-Semitism um, to student government so they could officially adopt a definition of anti-Semitism. Um, we knew that under Title VI, Jewish students are legally protected here. Um, but that didn't matter to us. It was the fact that we wanted students and even faculty and staff at the university to know that there is a definition of anti-Semitism. This is what the Jewish community defines it as, and this is what we're standing against, or standing for, excuse me. Um, this was in combination, um, one of the student organizations here on campus brought in a extremely anti-Semitic speaker. Um, we tried to have conversations with them and it failed and he still came to campus. So between all of this, we wanted to propose the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, I wanna point out kind of before I go into detail, it's saying that the bill did pass with an 81% majority in student government. Um, but throughout this whole process, we did face a lot of opposition. Um, Students United for Palestinian Rights, otherwise known as SUPER here on campus, um, during this whole process, they tried to delegitimize the Jewish Student Union. They tried to delegitimize Hillel, both during student government meetings as well as on Zoom, on social media, things like that. Um, as well as, um, you know, student government created this double standard against the Jewish Student Union, which I think was probably one of the most frustrating things. All these other communities were able to define what hate is to them. And they it passed through student government like that. It passed so fast. It was it passed in a night. But when it came to the Jewish students, there was this double standard. It was, well, we don't know if this is anti-Semitism. And these were non-Jewish students debating this definition of anti-Semitism with me. Um, so that was kind of like the beginning of the opposition and kind of where it really got bad. Um, and this is kind of where like my trauma started to develop um, was when we were in the process of both when we initially presented the bill and then when we retracted the bill, um, I was faced with a lot of anti-Semitic attacks. Um, very common like anti-Semitic tropes were flying left and right. Um, people were saying that the bill wasn't equitable, that my speech that I gave when I was retracting the bill um, was extremely offensive to the Arab community and that I was putting their community in danger, which I never even mentioned their community in my speech. Um, they were saying that the Jewish Student Union was trying to tra take control of the First Amendment, was trying to take control of free speech. Um, they were making claims that if any student were to criticize Israel, that they would be expelled from the university or suspended or put on academic probation. Um, so all of this was directed towards me because I was the face of the bill and I sat there for literally two hours on Zoom uh, as like a punching bag, essentially. Um, so between that, we decided to eventually, you know, retract the bill. Um, it was causing so many fractures and so much division within the university. Um, it just spun way out of control and it was eventually putting our community more harm 
and putting it in more harm than it was in a, in a safe spot. Um, you know, throughout this whole experience, I learned that media, that this, that media can be a great tool, but it can also be a weapon. Um, and I also learned that some of our allies aren't true allies, that when it came to actually stick up for us, like Debbie was talking about with these partnerships, that they said that they were an ally, but then when it came time to actually stand up for us, it was like, nope, nope, like, we're not getting involved with that. Um, and I think overall, the biggest thing that it showed us is that now more than ever, that there needed to be education. There needs to be education. There still needs to be education on what anti-Semitism is and how to safely protect your students. Thank you, Jordan. I mean, it's not easy, frankly, to share uh, that experience because of what you faced through the process. Uh, we're not going to gloss over what are just unacceptable behaviors and intolerable challenges that we as a community and you as students should not have to face. But even as we take in what is so difficult and challenging about the kind of situation you described, I also just want to lift up back to how to guide the way we can all make sure that we are uh, strengthening Jewish student communities on campus is investing in student leaders like Jordan and Jasmine. When you listen to Jordan, to what you just shared, your knowledge, your commitment, your understanding of the complexity, uh, the more we can have uh, Jordans and Jasmines on every campus capable of leading the way. Trust me, we'll, we'll be making serious progress. Um, Varun, I want to turn to you because as Debbie pointed out, so much of Hillel's work and really so much of um, the overall experience for Jewish students on campus is a function of the tone that gets set by uh, administrators, by our partners uh, in administrations uh, on campuses in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, and we feel very fortunate to actually be in partnership room with you. I know you've participated in other uh, Hillel programs over the years, so we really do appreciate that. Uh, Right now, no surprise to probably anyone tuning into this program that there's an enormous focus on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as a framework and, and as a way to make sure that all students can feel included, welcome, heard, seen, and accepted in a university setting. Um, Jordan alluded to this concern of double standard. And, and I think for many Jewish students and other members of the community, they have their questions of, OK, so where where does hate fit in when it's hate against Jews and, and where does anti-Semitism fit in? So just wanted to get your take on how you're seeing anti-Semitism either being incorporated or not into those DEI frameworks and any other thoughts or reactions you have on that topic. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks so much. It's so great to be with everyone. Very grateful for this conversation. Um, really, um, especially grateful for the students here, Jordan, Jasmine. It's nice to be with Jasmine as well at UCLA. I'm at USC. This Trojan Bruin uh, panel is as close as you can get to real interfaith work in the City of Angels. Um, those loyalties run deep. So <laughs> this is really nice. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate what all of you have said is which is that the last several years, I would say especially the last five years, have been very difficult. It's been a very difficult time on campus for a lot of students, including Jewish students. Um, Anti-Semitism has long been the number one hate crime against religious minorities in the country by a long shot. Um, but we've seen a public expression of it over the last five years that, quite frankly, I hadn't quite seen um, in my previous five or six years on this in this job. I'm the dean of religious and spiritual life. I used to oversee wellness crisis and threat. So I see the university from a 40,000 foot perspective. And in many ways, I see the soul of the university as well. And for me, the inflection point was the Unite the Right rally that happened in Charlottesville, where neo-Nazis mar marched across a college campus. And they marched across a college campus, I think, by design, because college campuses have become locations for a lot of the culture wars, a lot of the traumas of the world. Um, and people know that if they're able to make a statement on a college campus, there's a platform, a spotlight there that they might not get elsewhere. And so it has been very difficult for our Jewish students, especially to see things happening in the world with their, um, maybe with their community centers or their daycares or things happening in their community. And then also to see those things happening on campus. Um, as a result of this time that we're in, you know, we've also gone through a racial reckoning. We've gone through plagues of biblical 
proportions. It's been, you know, a, a really difficult time. Um, there has been a renewed interest energy effort um, on DEI initiatives. And so when I think when we think about this, we should really think about it in two different ways. The first is the curriculum that professors and departments and research centers themselves develop. That's work that professors have, you know, um, academic freedom to think about um, in and of themselves. Um, and so that's generally work university officials aren't involved with. We don't go into curriculum. We don't go into sort of micromanaging how professors teach or what they teach. Um, that's academic freedom. Um, but there are research entities on campuses that are explicitly focused on anti-Semitism. I'm lucky to be working on a university campus which has the Shoah Foundation Institute, the largest visual archive in the world established by Steven Spielberg that um, is focused on combating anti-Semitism in very public and global ways. Uh, it does have initiatives that focus on hate um, and, and we have one called Stronger Than Hate. How do we get beyond it, et cetera. Um, so different schools may have different um, professors or research units on their campus that are explicitly involved in combating anti-Semitism. The other part of it is this notion of training students or faculty or staff in a general DEI context in the way that we might train students on um, alcohol use or, or sexual misconduct, et cetera, the kinds of trainings that they might do online as a prerequisite for registration. At least on my campus, those are fairly new conversations. We're having them now. Um, some of it is what is required by law versus what we are going to offer. Um, and some of it is thinking about the entire context of how we do uh, DEI work within a context of training students, faculty, and staff, and also thinking about anti-Black racism, thinking about um, anti-LGBTQ discrimination, thinking about um, um, Islamophobia, issues that Israel advocates face on campus, Palestine advocates face on campus too. Those are all our students. And so we're thinking about this in a holistic way. Um, I will say it's been super helpful, at least from my perspective, to have uh, the ADL, Hillel, AEN, and other organizations and community, AJC, and other community partners, you know, the Federation. We, we're really lucky in LA to have so many resources to help us think about how we might come uh, up with um, training protocols that we do offer to faculty, students, and staff as part of a general onboarding to the university. But I, I will say something here that might be a little unpopular is that is a compliance-oriented approach. My job and my opportunity as Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life, and I think Hillel's opportunity too, is more about culture. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the metrics for um, comp uh, training are in terms of moving the needle. Is this something that meaningfully changes the way people mm -hmm. Um, act and move in the world, or does it just become another thing like that you click through like driving school? You know, we've been training students on sexual misconduct and alcohol abuse for years. It hasn't really, in my opinion, moved the needle on terms of changing the culture. That has to come from inner transformation. And that only comes when you open yourselves to experiencing the experiences of others, when you have empathy, when you know people. We know that if you learn about other people, you will change your mind. But even more than learning about other people is knowing someone. It's hard to hate, you know, people if you love people. It's hard to hate someone who's your roommate or your your spouse, your partner or your teacher because you have intimate relationships with them. I think the opportunities at schools that have offices of religious and spiritual lives like mine or schools that have Hillel's like all of them on the all of the schools on the panel are that those are locations where inner transformation happens, where hearts and minds are changed, where people know and grow alongside each other where people see experiences in very different ways, even intra-community experiences, even Jewish students who might have very different experiences, different perspectives, different backgrounds, um, coming together and learning from each other. And so um, I feel like there is potentially an opportunity around training. To me, the real opportunity at a research university, a place where the whole world meets and knows each other, is less about the compliance part and more about the culture. And I think Hillel's and Abad's and Offices of Religious and Spiritual Life are really on the front lines of that kind of work. Yeah, thank you, Varun. I, it's really important to uh, name that practical reality. Like checking the box is not going to solve this problem, even if that means okay. Now, anti-Semitism is included in you know that DEI training. I, I will say we want anti-Semitism, or I, I'm speaking on behalf of Phil. We we want that included because there is a, a baseline of um, parody and, and frankly, just uh, broader recognition that can come when anti-Semitism is included among the array of uh, issues that students need to understand and faculty 
need to understand, but it is not uh, by any stretch sufficient. You know, we, as everyone on the panel knows, Hillel, we are in the business of changing hearts and minds. Our, our greatest work is through inspiration and transformation when it comes to the lives of the students that we're able to serve. So, so we're all about that. And I, I'd love to continue to think even after the panel about what does it mean in terms of cultural transformation to build on some of the brass tacks that we will address uh, as well. Um, I wanna shift, uh, Jasmine, back to you for the student perspective uh, on social media. Of course, students are on campus and thank God students are back on campus after uh, what has been such a difficult couple of years with the pandemic. But the reality of student experience doesn't uh, end and begin you know, on the quad. I mean, a lot of it's here and on other devices. So uh, talk to us about um, what anti-Semitism looks like in social media for students from your point of view uh, and how that even differs from what you may see literally on campus. Sure. So I think coming after the pandemic, the social media took a huge front in regards to posting about anything in regards to Judaism and anti-Semitism. People got to hide behind their screens, manipulate senti sentiments and sentences that they normally wouldn't come out on our campus and say, it's a lot easier to grab your cell phone and write something extremely anti-Semitic than going on campus and saying it. I think that social media has proven yet again to be another very difficult challenge for students to be navigating um, social media. While it is an amazing space for us to be connecting, it definitely comes with its own difficulties. Um, personally, I use I have used social media to be an activist and a voice for your students. Um, I can only speak for myself. Jordan and I work very closely on the Israel cohort in the Inter Hillel International Space. And we forge that question to the students that we speak to. And we ask, are you feeling about social media? What is, what is your perspective on standing up? Or do you feel that there's no benefit at all? And some have different perspectives. Some like me feel that the only way we can fight these sentiments and sentiments is speaking for the community. And others feel like we are just exhausted and we don't see that it'll make such a huge difference. And I think this exhaustion feeling is something that Jewish students are navigating and social media has only furthered that feeling. Um, as I said, I think that coming after this May and coming back to school, um, it's a very different world we are in a very different world because we saw on a whole different level what social media can do. I know I felt like I was completely isolated, that we didn't have any allies, that time and time again, Jewish students are only coming to speak um, on behalf of each other, but we are lacking support from others. That feeling is, it's dangerous and difficult. Um, so a lot of coalition building, I think, is maybe the answer to that feeling. And I know that that's kind of the job I've taken on at UCLA is, OK, well, we don't have allies. And this past May, and social media continues to prove that. But what can we do? And that's a lot of our work right now. And the idea that we should be coming together for other communities so that they can come together with us is kind of solution-oriented perspective on that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jazzy. And, and I think relates very much back to what Varun was sharing in, you know, promoting relationship, promoting mutual understanding, even if we also heard earlier from Jordan that sometimes it can be frustrating because you feel like even with those efforts, you're not necessarily seeing the, the mutual support. Um, Jordan, I want to come back to you because you were involved in helping the architect uh, Hill International campaign, Own Your Star, in social media. Um, can you tell us about the campaign, why you got involved, and what impact you think it can have? Yeah, so um, I was fortunate enough to be on the working group for Own Your Star. Um, we started having these conversations at the end of the last academic year, and they carried all throughout the summer. Um, and it was this idea that Jewish students feel scared to show their Jewish pride. 
myself included. There are times where I feel like I can walk right into campus with my Jewish star and scream, I'm Israel Chai, and be just fine. And then the next day, I could feel like I want to hide in my winter jacket and just kind of go about my day and not even tell people that I'm Jewish. Um, so it's this idea that we really just wanted to empower all Jewish students, regardless of whether or not you're involved in Hillel. Um, we wanted them to feel proud coming back onto campus and kind of give them this like motivational boost that like, be proud to be Jewish because it is something so unique to your identity. Um, when we were trying to figure out, you know, the best way to do this and we figured a social media campaign and just like Jazzy touched on, like social media really changed how, how college students think about different things during the pandemic. And so um, we decided to launch the social media campaign. Um, and then when the student cabinet convened in Washington, DC a few months ago, is when we kind of got like the ground running, how all of us were going to contribute. Um, because as a student cabinet, we're kind of like the voices of Jewish students who are involved in Hillel around the world, right? So we were trying to figure out how we could get all these students involved. Um, and so essentially what we did is um, each student cabinet member, as well as Hillel presidents, um, were able to receive a sweatshirt, which was called the Anti-Anti-Semitism Club. Um, really cool sweatshirt. And so we were able to kind of have like a physical piece of swag, if you will, to represent this campaign on social media. Um, and so all of us on the day of the social of the campaign launch, we all wore our sweatshirts, posted it on social media. Um, and it got, you know, great traction, great attention from all around the world. Um, we had, you know, high level celebrities like Mayim Bialik was in on the campaign. Um, we had the CEO of Facebook. She was in on the campaign as well. So um, I think it really just allowed students to feel a sense of Jewish pride. Um, I know on campus, because of the campaign, um, I was able to increase a lot of that relationship building um, just because non-Jewish student leaders on campus were able to see like, wow, like they are not scared to stand up in the face of opposition. They're not scared to say I am Jewish, even though there's anti-Semitism swirling all around me. Uh, which I think was pretty cool. So um, although the campaign has ended, I think it really gave a boost of confidence for Jewish student leaders and just your average Jewish college student on campus to, you know, really be proud to be Jewish, wear your Jewish star, uh, to own your star, if you will, um, and just and just have that sense of confidence. It was a really cool campaign. Um, I'm excited to see kind of like what the results of the campaign were, how many people we hit, where we hit it. Um, and then, you know, we'll see what we can do from there. Yeah, fantastic. And honestly, even as we talk about different ways that we can collectively take on anti-Semitism, it's just uh, both, I think, positive and inspiring when a group of students can come together and, and actually just take action in this cross-cutting way. And uh, Jordan, I was looking at some of the data on the campaign yesterday. We had more than 5 million people exposed in viewing the, the campaign. And that uh, included some really amazing individual stories uh, of students and others who participated. So uh, thanks for sharing more about that. Um, Varun, I want to turn to you know what, what is often, honestly, a, a third rail in these conversations, which is how we as a community can um, understand the role that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict plays in um, administrators' uh, approach to taking on issues of anti-Semitism. Um, so just wanna hear your thoughts on where the complexity of the conflict uh, and the way it gets uh, transmitted through to campus, uh, you know, how that uh, impacts, you know, an administration's um, ability and approach to speaking out uh, on issues of anti-Semitism. Sure. Thank you for that. Uh, you're absolutely right. I do find in the work that I do, which is um, a lot of interfaith work, intercultural work, interreligious work, uh, Israel-Palestine can be the third rail. Um, I've come from day one, really, this is year 14 on the job. From day one, I came to the conclusion that um, my office wouldn't publicly sponsor or um, uh, any event on Israel-Palestine, because if I were to do that, um, 
I wouldn't be able to work with Jewish and Muslim students in the way that only I can work for, with Jewish and Muslim students as the chaplain to make sure that they have accommodation around high holidays or kosher halal or worship spaces or the other things. And once I lose trust, then suddenly I can't do the things that I should be doing. It, I think because I'm a Hindu, it made it easier for me in some ways to play it and a lawyer that also helped uh, some kind of mediating role. But, um, but at the same time, if the university's chaplain can't speak publicly about Israel-Palestine, then how are we modeling what that conversation could or should look like? And I began to see the downside of my decision over the last few years. Um, I think personally, the issue, um, when I first got to USC, a lot of the anti-Semitism we confronted was more explicit, I guess you could say. It was easy to easier to name and frame and to call out without exception. Um, over the last three or four years, almost all of the incidents in some ways implicate Israel-Palestine. And one of the challenges uh, I have found is in the definition of Zionism. I think people use the word Zionism in different ways, um, but yet they are talking across difference as if they're all using it in the same way. There, it would be helpful to have a literacy campaign around what Zionism is because Zionism means different things for different people. Um, is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism? That's the fundamental question that a lot of folks are wrestling with. I mean, in some ways it depends on what you mean by Zionism. Um, and, uh, and in the absence of a shared definition, people are gonna experience that question in different ways. Um, so I think that's the real challenge in terms of Israel-Palestine or in talking about it, it from an administrator point of view. Uh, of course, we have to have the free speech free exchange of ideas on all political issues, even very critical issues. You know, professors, students, faculty and staff are very critical of other nations, including the United States. Um, but at what point is the line crossed? At what point do we it degenerate into anti-Semitic tropes? And, and where do we go to think about this? Is it an executive order? Is it the law? Uh, you know, one of the challenges I think with the IRA definition is that even though it doesn't explicitly equate anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, you can read that into it. It, seems, it might suggest it in a particular way. And I think it's, that's going to make it very difficult for any university, quite frankly, to adopt that definition because that's the way people are going to encounter it. And so, um, and then of course, the question of Israel-Palestine splits the Jewish community too. You know, the Jewish community is not a monolithic community. There are Jewish students on our campus who are Zionist and Jewish students on our campus who call themselves anti-Zionist. They are all Jewish. Um, and then it becomes a little more complicated in terms of where is anti-Semitism within this sort of um, dialectic within the Jewish community itself. And so it is complicated. Um, it, I, I think universities are, are often err on the side of free speech. So we won't wanna do anything that feels like we're chilling the legitimate sort of political critique or conversation in ways that, um, that we should really be upholding. Um, but at the same time, we have values around hate, um, and so that becomes a challenge. And the other challenge here is that hate speech also is constitutionally protected speech, and there's a generational difference in terms of how students versus administrators interpret free speech. 65% uh, of college students want to put limits on constitutionally protected free speech because they grew up in an environment where they saw the worst of humanity, as uh, our students were saying on this panel. They saw every anonymous comment on every chat box. They saw their friends getting doxxed and defamed online. They have been subjected to the worst and most sort of toxic forms of anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, Islamophobia, everything. They've seen it all in ways that my generation never saw. You would never say something to someone in person that you might say anonymously online. And so they want their friends. They want to protect their friends. And that's beautiful. That's empathy. That's what we want to see. But for administrators, we grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where free speech was the thing that was sacred on a university campus. We don't punish people for constitutionally protected free speech. And as someone who's a religious and ethnic minority in the United States, I am concerned that as soon as we start limiting free speech, it's the minoritized and marginalized communities that are the ones that are gonna actually suffer the most. Um, that's what the history of the country has shown us. And so uh, these things are complicated. They're legal issues, they're emotional issues, they're cultural issues, they're core issues of identity. Um, but, um, but I think some kind of literacy around the definitions people use could be helpful because where I see a lot of conflict is that people are using different definitions and projecting that other people are using definitions in ways that they are. 
Thank you. Uh, wow, that's there's a lot there, Varun. I appreciate your delving into the um, depth and complexity of that. I don't. Uh, I do want to turn back to education, and Debbie, we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. Before we do, though, um, I, I think one of the challenges I know we see at Hill International is that even if uh, people, particularly in a university setting, want to be living in a space of free speech and uh, engaged in you know political debate, uh, which you know is very on brand activity for a university campus, all too often in the context of Israel, it, it devolves into pretty extreme demonization. At least that's you know again what what we've seen. We certainly saw that in May. Which, which then gets you into this very different space that does not feel like an intellectual pursuit or a political debate, but instead feels like you know, a direct marginalization and isolation of a particular community. And as you pointed out, Jewish students are all over the map in terms of their own views, but often in the context of that demonization, they are being uh, treated in a monolithic way and in a discriminatory way. So I. With that, I just want to hear from Jasmine, from Jordan, Debbie. Um, is that something you've perceived or seen in terms of this um, uh, transition from what starts as a political debate or discussion and ends up in this demonizing and, and marginalizing space? I mean, yeah, I'll jump in. I think that, you know, I've seen it in, in many different situations that this conversation I mean, I guess you have the one thing where the conversation can quickly devolve from legitimate criticism of Israeli politics into attacks um, to anyone who feels a connection to Israel. Um, I, you know, what I also see is that, um, I mean, I appreciate what Varun was saying about a shared definition. I wish <laughs> that that we could get there. And when we talk about, um, you know, culture versus compliance, I mean, that's like real work to do in the space of culture. Um, but I'd say in the absence of shared definitions, what, what we're seeing is um, Jewish students feeling uncomfortable expressing their support for Israel um, for fear of being isolated from progressive spaces. And we're also seeing um, Jewish students feeling intimidation, even um, maybe there's a campus incident that, Eve, you know, is, is pretty clearly anti-Israel, uh, you know, is leading with that. And so maybe blurry if it's officially anti-Semitism, but it really does affect the campus climate for Jewish students and for many other minorities also. Um, and so it, it's very difficult to um, to keep those things separate. And so yeah. on your star, I mean, we, we had students that felt uncomfortable wearing their stars on our campus after an anti-Israel incident. And, you know, it for students that feel connected to the Jewish homeland, you can't really separate them. Um, it's It can be really difficult. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and you point out something that, again, I think is a, a really difficult dimension of this challenge, which is if, as so many people on the panel have shared, we believe that promoting education, promoting empathy and promoting uh, collective understanding is important. Um, if you can't do that in authentic ways because, you know, a student's uh, affinity to Israel or just Jewish identity is, is creating a barrier to that uh, relationship. Obviously, that's a big issue. Um, Jordan and Jasmine, I, I want to turn back to you. Um, we've gotten some questions streaming in about faculty and the role of faculty in terms of uh, this challenge and issue. Um, have either of you uh, encountered faculty who you believe were um, uh, approaching their, their work, their classes, their messages in ways um, that had an anti-Semitic bias? It's funny that you bring that up, Adam, because I'm in a class similar to that right now as we speak. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting dynamic because I've heard about stories about students dealing with this stuff. And I was like, you know, I'm here to support you, but I'm like, I'm not going to encounter that. Like, that's just there's no way. And then here we go. I, I wouldn't say I've encountered an anti-Semitism bias, but I feel it's getting to that point. Um, just to give you just quick background context, if you will, um, this particular professor um, with every, this is a sociology class, mind you, so literally talking about society, but um, this, this professor likes to, every example, every, um, 
just like everything that they try to do to relate it to a real world example, like a concept to a real example, they talk about uh, Palestine. They talk about um, Students United for Palestinian Rights. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, use whatever examples you want. Like, I don't care. But it's the fact that they keep doing it. And it's the subtle things that just makes me uncomfortable. Like, the professor will keep looking at me. And the, like, whenever they talk about this, they'll talk about me. Or the, he'll make eye contact with me. Or my favorite part is when he'll use this example and then say, Jordan, can you talk a little bit about what you do at Hill International? And it's like, you could tell that the professor is trying to, is trying to pin me up against the conflict. Um, and so the professor is doing these subtle things. I don't really know what he's trying to get at. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if he's trying to rile me up, but, um, you know, having faculty who have these anti-Semitic anti bias, in my opinion, creates for a very hostile environment because you know, you have the student who is trying to work for the grade and is trying to get a good grade and is trying to be successful and learn in the class and collaborate with their peers. But if this professor is um, interfering with their intersectionality, with their identity and like who they truly are, then it makes for such a hostile and learning environment because then if the student wants to report it, they're scared that the report's going to go back to the professor. It's going to affect their grade, their exams, so on and so forth. So. Um, it creates a really hostile environment, and I think students just don't necessarily know how to find that safe space. Thankfully, I think, you know, Hillel International has, take, has spearheaded that so much, you know, with the new collaboration with ADL um, and just Hillel staff, you know, creating that safe space. I'm sure Debbie can relate to this a lot that, like, you know, one of the biggest things for staff is to create that safe space for Jewish students just to go and talk. Um, I can't tell you how many times I go to my Hillel building um, I walk into one of my staff stores and I just talk about the issues that are going on and they help so much with that. So I think just creating that safe space for students to navigate that classroom environment and this like weird concept of like professors having this anti-Semitic bias, um, I think will help a lot. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And Jordan, it's so important that you're underscoring just the value of a strong Hillel, a strong Jewish student, community uh, on campus, regardless of how these issues present, regardless of whether there is a, a you know, cooperative or, or great partnering administration or not, or whatever the issues may be, making sure that we have the uh, community infrastructure and strength where students feel heard and they feel taken care of and they have partners. Because let me tell you, we have seen even more extreme examples with TA saying, you know, I'm downgrading someone because that so-and-so expletive, you know, is a Zionist, you know, in those situations, those are clear cut and we are aggressively uh, making sure that they are addressed. And for any parent or student who's listening in, please, please, please report these issues. We will take them on and we will make sure that they're rectified because at the end of the day, academic institutions need to be places of learning. And if students literally cannot um, participate fully in those experiences because of their legitimate Jewish identities, that is, that's obviously a complete uh, unacceptable situation that uh, we'll deal with. Um, Jazzy, I, I want to go back to you to get um, your perspective. We have had a lot of questions stream in around, well, I, I have a student who's going to be going to college next year or in two years, what do I tell them? How do I prepare them uh, so that they can have a great experience, but also so they can be prepared uh, for what they might encounter? Yeah, for sure. So before I joined the Bruin community, I was actually over at UC Davis and then transferred to schools. So I was up north and now I'm back down in Southern California, which is my hometown which actually has given me a very unique insight into different, two different college experiences, um, two different campuses, what the anti-Semitism might look like at one or the other. Um, I just want to say I really encourage students to come into college as proud Jews because there is nothing stronger than being proud to be Jewish in the fight against anti-Semitism because no one can take that away from you show up to Hillel, be a part of a community, because a community for me has been one of the most grounding feelings going forward in my college experience. Um, I might be up till 12 o'clock on a BDS meeting, 
but I know that I'm surrounded by love and support from everybody that's on that call, whether that's Hillel's space or Bruins for Israel down here or up north, it was Aggies for Israel. Um, involve yourself in a community because what you might be going through um, is difficult. And I think we can all acknowledge that. But there's something so powerful about being Jewish. There's something so powerful about knowing that you have this community around you. Um, don't be afraid because there's something unique about being Jewish. And hold on to that feeling. Um, so if there are any parents, um, I know my parents are watching right now. They raised me to be a proud Jew. And Jordan's parents raised him to be a proud Jew. And we are so lucky that we are raised like that um, and that we can come to our college campuses ready to take on the fight. So that's kind of what I would have to say. Be positive. <laughs> yeah, that was be beautifully said, Jasmine. It really, um, thank you for that. Speaking of parents who raised you and I'm sure are very proud as uh, they're seeing your leadership in the context of this discussion, you know, I'll turn it uh, to Varun and to Debbie. As we think about parents and grandparents and community members who want to make a difference, they want to be helpful in taking on uh, challenges of anti-Semitism on campus, what's your advice to them? Debbie, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, I'll dive. Um, there's so many things. Um, I think in terms of being engaged in your local community, um, I mean, the whole, this is a how-to guide, right? And that starts with ed education. So understanding what's going on in your local school systems, working, you know, encouraging pro ADL programs like No Place for Hate or other programs to come um, and just be a part of your local community extremely important um no minority can take on any um you know hatred just all by themselves and the adl does a really good job of educating the broader community about how they can all play a role um i'd say also helping looking for ways to help students understand israel again in whether it's public school education or supplementary education why did jews value it why is it controversial to some how can they be prepared um I don't, I just want to say you do not need to send your student to college with talking points for every single challenge that they may encounter. Um, instilling a sense of pride that it's okay to own their identity and not know the answer to everything is fine. Um, the other thing I want to say to parents and, and grandparents, I guess, if you're sending um, folks off to college is to trust the process. Um, make sure that your student does connect with the Hillel if they have one on their campus or other, you know, campus resources we know what to do if we have your students information we know how to provide support to them if we need them they will not fall through the cracks we may not see them for a few months and that's fine but um we know that they're there and they know that that we're here and so you know when you're thinking of sending your student off to college part of it's the preparation and part of it's knowing that um there's no one type of jewish life that you have to lead in college to receive support from Hillel or from your university if you're going through a challenging time. Um, and so to make people aware of the resources that exist for them so that they're ready to tap in, so the students are ready to tap into them when they are when they need them is probably the most important. Terrific. Um, and Varun, if, if you want to briefly add to that, I mean, Debbie alluded to the <laughs> fact, by all means, connect with your Hillel or other Jewish organization. Um, so uh, the student you know, does feel a part of a community and has access to all the resources we and others offer, but also, you know, recognizing and trusting that universities offer a tremendous amount of support and resource, you know, for them as well. But Varun, please. Sure. I'd like to just reiterate what Jasmine said, which is no student should feel like they can't be their authentic self on campus. They should be proud in their identity. They should feel like they have a community of care and support and they shouldn't, they should lean into love and not fear. Um, you know, my, um, I, I try to be optimistic, uh, so I don't want to paint a doom and gloom scenario. I want Jewish students to feel like empowered that they can thrive and achieve their dreams and any campus that they go to. And I think that's true. I don't like the doom and gloom scenario because I don't think it's helpful, but I don't think it's true too. The reality is our campuses are safe for Jewish students. I ran the threat assessment team. Whenever we have anti-Semitic incidents, we're working with LAPD, FBI, we're working with local law enforcement. We've got our eyes on social media. 
um, we, we've got your students back. Like our, your students are safe on our college campuses and they have communities of care and support around them. And I, you know, I, I don't want this to be interpreted the wrong way, but you know, Martin Luther King famously said that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. It doesn't take a sharp right turn. That means generationally we get better. And we have gotten better in higher education. Like USC was in a very anti-Semitic place. It deserved its reputation as being an anti-Semitic place. In the 1930s, we had a Nazi cell operating out of our German department on campus. We had a president whose name we just removed from the center of our building because he was an anti-Semitic eugenicist. In the 1970s, we had swastikas painted on our you know, Jewish red, uh, students' halls, uh, residence halls and fraternities and sororities. Now those instances which were mainstream, normalized, where students had no resources to go to, um, they're, they're anomalies. And what I see that most parents see is that on campuses as large as all of ours, all of our campuses on this panel are the sizes of mid-sized American cities, essentially. These are huge, these are cities within cities. Whenever something happens on the campus that might be anti-Semitic, I find that that's outlier behavior. That, that might be one, that might be some people who have an outsized impact. But I also get hundreds of emails of support, hundreds of emails of people saying, this isn't who we are. There are far more people who, at least on my campus, will speak out against it than will actually endorse it. And that never gets any play. It never gets any headlines. But that is actually the majority by far of the sentiment that are aligned with our value. And so I want our parents to feel as though their students can go anywhere and do anything. And um, it's important that they're aware of the realities of the world, but um, but college is a time where you you, you live your dreams. And um, you're, in my experience, Jewish students are safe on our college campuses to do that in ways that they might not have always been. Yeah, no, I appreciate your both naming the reality of where we've been at so many institutions, including USC. But you know, fortunately, uh, I often say it's a it's a Dickensian moment, you know, it's definitely best of times for Jewish students in this moment, as well as worst of times in terms of this spike in anti-Semitism. I mean, there are tremendous opportunities for Jewish students. And to that end, um, Debbie, I, I would just ask you to comment for parents and families. They will read about a given campus and an issue that, you know, arose. Should they keep their students away from that campus based on whatever they read in this journal or this email, or how should they think about that? Uh, please don't do that <laughs> to all the parents that are um, out there. Uh, everyone has to make their own decision on what higher education institution is going to fit your budget and your interests and your needs. And, you know, it's a very, it can be a very complex decision. Um, but I hope that the media won't play too much into it. Um, no one is writing stories or doing um, six o'clock news um, pieces on the 200 person social event that we have here. They're doing stuff on, they're doing pieces on, um, you know, the flyers on our campus two days before. So diligence, look into the Hillel or other organizations, um, check out their calendars, see what's going on. Um, probably one of the most exciting things I read out of the recent ADL Hillel survey um, was that 74% of Jewish students who are connected to a Jewish community um, felt, or sorry, students who felt safer on a Jewish, you know, if there were issues of anti-Semitism or challenges on that campus, 74% of students who reported feeling safe and supported were involved in Jewish communities um, versus only 65%, which is still a good number of folks that weren't as connected. So Adam, you'll tell me if I'm getting the numbers right, but yeah. to me, that no, the numbers neck, are wherever you are. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We're, I'm realizing we're gonna get the hook in, in about 60 seconds. So um, listen, it, we could go on. There's so much to cover. We didn't talk as much as we could have around all of the education initiatives that we're pursuing, which are critical, the advocacy efforts. Please, anyone listening, know that Hillel, other organizations, partners are really taking this issue seriously. We welcome your further guidance and your support. I wanna thank all of the panelists for what has been a terrific, uh, an informative conversation. To learn more about the work that uh, we are doing at Hillel uh, and about the Hillel ADL survey results, go to hill.org. And then I, I just wanna close by uh, promoting the fact that uh, this uh, evening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, there's the closing session for Never Is Now featuring Juju Chang, Amy Spitalnik, actress Tracy Ellis Ross, writer and comedian Baratunde Thurston, uh, WNBA icon Sue Bird and and the uh, you know wonderful Rabbi David Wolpe, um, so please join for that. 
Thank you all and have a great evening.